Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Beverly Spencer. I'm here with the Law Society to welcome you. To those of you who uh, weren't with us this morning, welcome this afternoon to the Six Minute Estates Lawyer. Uh, to those of you who just picked up the binders, you'll notice a couple of extra papers tucked in the side. They go in tabs 9, tab 13, and tab 14. So you can put them where they belong. And uh, finally, our chair for today, or for this afternoon rather, is Tim Uden. He's a partner at Davies Ward and Beck where he works in the area of trusts and estates, including both estates and trust planning and litigation. <coughs> Please help me welcome Tim Uden. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to say very, very little. Um, my job is really just to be a timekeeper, and um, uh, so I'm going to be quite rigorous in doing that, although we did actually give ourselves a bit more time than the six minutes, so uh, we might just give people a leeway of uh, a minute or so over their six minutes. Um, Margaret O'Sullivan, uh, I think, is our first scheduled speaker, and I don't think she is here. Um, but uh, I guess we had a, op uh, a time for the opening remarks that uh, we haven't gone by yet, so she might appear at any time. But I think rather than uh, just wait around or me telling jokes or anything like that, it, it's better that we'll just start, and um, we'll start with Mary McGregor, and uh, we'll slip uh, Margaret O'Sullivan in uh, when she arrives. Um, so uh, let's um, let's begin. Uh, I'm not going to do. Um, sorry, I'm now switching to my more relaxed mode. Um, we're not going to be introducing uh, the people in terms of reading out their bios or even summarizing them. We'll simply identify them by name. You probably know. Uh, them already. Uh, the one thing I should get credit for as far as this program goes is for getting this uh, great uh, cast of stars. Um, but just in case you don't know any of them, uh, I'll simply say who they are and then they'll get on with it. Um, so uh, in default of Margaret O'Sullivan being here, we'll begin <laughs> with Mary McGregor, uh, who will be speaking about uh, mediation in estate matters. Good afternoon, everybody. I've been trying to think what I would do in six minutes, and I can say to you, read Rule 75.1, and I can say to you, read my paper, and I could leave. But in fact, I think I can do a little bit better than that today. Um, one of the great benefits of mediation in estate disputes is, of course, that it uh, occurs very early in the proceedings, and I'll talk a little bit about the rule, unless Tim yanks me off by the neck. Um, what it really does is it gives the parties an opportunity to work out their own solution, facilitated, of course, by a mediator, and um, it gives them a forum to get rid of their anger and their frustration in, you know, in an open but controlled setting or in the private caucus sessions that you'll have in the mediation sessions. Um, I, I think I, you know, I'm firmly committed to the mediation process, and I, I'm glad that Toronto is part of the, mandatory, or of the, of the pilot project for mandatory mediation. The theme song of mediators, which some of you have probably already heard, with great respect to Mick Jagger, goes something like this. You can't always get what you want, but sometimes you, if you try, you will find you get what you need. So the mediation process is to get people to a point to get what they need out of the litigation process. And the role of our, ourselves as professional advisors, or indeed ourselves as mediators, is to get people to that point where they're trying. I, we have some, idea, uh, some ideas for the professionals. Gail Ann is going to be talking about putting clauses in wills and other things you can do at the planning process, and I'm talking about mandatory mediation in estates. Of course, you can always do an informal, voluntary kind of mediation before the litigation erupts, but if the litigation erupts, then Rule 75 tells you how you go about it. Um, not every litigation that has an estate as a party is subject to the estate mandatory mediation rules. Rule 75, however, does cover a very broad range of litigation, including passings of accounts, formal proofs of wills, supportive dependents, proceedings under the Substitute Decisions Act, dealing with absentees, um, the Estates Act proceedings, Trustee Act proceedings, variation of trust, um, all those applications for the opinion, advice, and direction of the court where estates and trusts are involved, and of course, Family Law Act claims on death for equalization of property. So as soon as the time for all the appearances are in, then the moving party has to bring a motion for directions to the court. And similar to the kinds of directions that we would get in usual estate 
contested proceedings this motion for directions will identify the issues to be mediated who will have carriage and who will respond in the mediation the time periods the notice to people who have submitted their rights to the court and most importantly who will pay the costs and how those will be divided up so you're, you get an order for directions and it contains all those things and then within 30 days of that order you have to pick a mediator now there is a roster of mediators but there's no segregated estate section so if you pick from the roster or you get assigned from the roster there's no guarantee you're going to get somebody who's familiar with estate issues and I like to think that um, if you have a mediator who understands the estate issues that are going to be raised, you're going to get someone who can review with the parties the various options that have to be explored. You're going to get a realistic view of the legal issues that have to be dealt with and, of course, the possible outcomes of the positions that people take. So you get to the point where you get med your mediator if the parties can't agree, and sometimes parties can't agree on anything, so you get a mediator assigned to you. Once that's done, then each party must prepare a mediation brief, and I've included at the back of the paper a form of mediation brief. It doesn't have any of the, you know, the funny stuff in it that we sometimes put in sample material. It's just to give you an outline of what it should look like. You have to identify the facts that are relevant, the law which is relevant. Um, you have to set out the position of the party who's attending at the mediation and of course include what you consider are the relevant documents. The emphasis is on the word brief however because the mediators don't want to wade through all of the legal documents which have got you to that to that stage of mediation. On the day of mediation the people who have been designated in the order for directions as designated parties must attend. That's the mandatory feature. They can get there and they can pout for three hours and not participate but they have to get in the door. Um, there are, there are, are of course consequences for failure to attend. Um, everybody who has authority to settle must be there or have that authorized person on deck during the mediation so that if a settlement can be reached you do get to the settlement. Um, essential to the concept of mediation is the idea that all of the communications and all of the uh, mediators notes and records are deemed by the rule to be without prejudice so they cannot be used in subsequent litigation in the same way that without prejudice proceedings happen at any event so you can get to some possible outcomes you can get a full settlement at the mediation you can get a partial settlement at the mediation you can fail totally at the mediation, or sometimes you get to a point where at least you've got an agreement in principle that the parties are going to work on. And because this happens early in the process, the, the results are very encouraging because you have an agreement the parties are likely to respect because they've made the agreement themselves. And that's very attractive. It's been facilitated by the mediator, but it is the agreement of the parties. It's obviously a huge saving of time and a huger saving of money. And uh, it, it certainly ends the process right then and there. And it, it's certainly something that feeds into the, into the dynamics of a family rather than destroys the dynamics of the family. So I don't know how I did with my six minutes, but read the paper if you need to know anything else. Thank you. this is working but you did just fine in terms of the, the six minutes um, and I apologize to Margaret O'Sullivan for really uh, beginning ahead of time and she was she was here dead on time and uh, so she, she's on my right now and so she's here now and so um, Margaret actually uh, has to go uh, fairly soon so we're going to go next uh, within six minutes uh, so we're going to go next to Margaret O'Sullivan who's going to be speaking on the prudent investor rule Thank you, Tim. I don't know why it's not the five-minute lawyer, then I could just ask, you know, five minutes of your time, but I'm going to have to ask for six minutes of your time. In any event, uh, you will find in your binder a paper that I have written, which is a little lengthier than this six-minute dissertation, and uh, that can be your future reference if you would like to refer to it in terms of a detailed analysis uh, of this new legislation. As well, it also has a precedent in it, which you may want to consider in terms of uh, a new investment powers provision to incorporate into your wills and trusts. Um, there are others available as well that you might wish to refer to and other will planning reference works, but that is one example. Uh, so what I'll like to do in my six minutes is just present a very brief overview of the major impacts of this legislation. 
which came into effect on July 1, by the way, 1999. By far the uh, most sweeping change uh, to the law governing trustee investment is the introduction of a new standard of care. Uh, in my view, it's a new standard of care. Maybe that's somewhat under dispute. I think Tim might have a different view. Uh, incorporating the prudent investor rule. Under prior legislation, if a trust agreement didn't provide broad investment authority, as you're aware, a trustee was obligated to invest only in trustee investments provided under the Trustee Act. And they were, and are very conservative, heavily fixed, income-oriented. Um, however, it's always been the practice in most well-drawn Ontario trusts and wills to uh, essentially incorporate much broader authority, so essentially that we, we aren't into the legal list. Um, case law has always determined what was a prudent investment for trustees, and it has always focused on what the nature is of the individual investment as opposed to, for example, an overall portfolio strategy. Now with the new rule, a trustee may now invest trust property in any form of property in which a prudent investor might invest and must exercise the care, skill, diligence and judgment any prudent investor would exercise in making investments. So as a result, the types of investments that trustees may invest in are considerably broader. As well, there is now authority to invest in mutual funds and common funds. The new legislation specifically authorizes trustees to invest in mutual funds, notwithstanding any rule of law that may prohibit a trustee from delegating his or her powers or duties. Now this change is a long-awaited one because of the problems posed by uh, a variety of Ontario case law which essentially held that mutual funds were improper investments for trustees on the ba basis that they constitute an improper delegation of investment decision-making authority. The new legislation also now specifically authorizes trustees to invest in common trust funds if trust property is held by co-trustees and one of the co-trustees is a trust company. Common trust funds, as you may be aware, are pooled investment funds which are often used by a trust company to consolidate the investment management of trusts and estates that a trust company administers as a trustee. So this amendment will hopefully resolve any issue arising with respect to a non-corporate trustee's ability to invest in common funds of a trust company if a trust company is co-trustee with an individual. <clears throat> Mandatory investment criteria, criteria are now provided which a trustee is now obligated to consider in planning the investment of trust property. Uh, they're detailed in the paper, I'll just very briefly go over them. The criteria include general economic conditions, the possible effect of inflation or deflation, the expected tax consequences of investment decisions or strategies, the role that each investment or course of action plays within the overall trust portfolio, the expected total return from income and the appreciation of capital, needs for liquidity, regularity of income and preservation or appreciation of capital, and an asset special relationship or special value, if any, to the purposes of the trust or to one or more of the beneficiaries. So those are the criteria or references which the trustee is always to have in mind in coming up with an investment strategy and plan for the trust or the estate. The new legislation now also requires that trustees diversify the investments of a trust as appropriate, having regard to the requirements of the trust, since there might be particular exceptions to that or other reasons why diversification may not be applied across the board, and to general economic and investment market conditions. Trustees are now also expressly authorized to obtain investment advice. However, there is no specific authority allowing trustees to delegate investment decision making, which is a, a problem, and I have detailed that in my paper and you might wish to read that critique. The new legislation also provides increased protection to trustees for investment losses of the trust. So a trustee is not liable for investment losses if the conduct of the trustee leading to the loss conformed to a plan or strategy which essentially a prudent investor could adopt. So as opposed to under the old rule which would essentially you were responsible for the losses but you didn't get a lot of credit for the gains if you looked at uh, um, losses on an individual basis, now the attention is really focused on the 
on the investment plan as a whole uh, and the portfolio approach as opposed to isolated investments. What impact will these amendments have on trustee investment practice? Okay. Well, hopefully we'll have better returns for beneficiaries because I think that trustees will now be forced to take a, a more proactive approach to trust investment. And if that's the case, then hopefully they will achieve higher returns and in many, many cases with less risk. <clears throat> there will be a broader range of investments which trustees can now invest in. So for example, some of the uh, specialty type investments such as derivatives, futures, options, those sorts of things that generally we steered trustees away from because they were considered, at least under case law, to be too high risk, therefore imprudent. Well, that's no longer the case under the new rule. Essentially, we don't look at the nature of the investment, but we look at the role it can play within the entire portfolio. Um, so those sorts of restrictions are removed, and where it's now appropriate to do so, uh, trustees may invest in these specialty type investments, which in some circumstances will hope, uh, hopefully enhance an overall investment return, uh, and in some cases uh, reduce risk. So for example, I'm thinking of things like puts and calls and uh, hedging, particularly for foreign exchange purposes, that sort of thing. Um, with the legitimization of mutual funds now for use in trust in the state, so that now we essentially we know that there's no problem from a legal point using them, I think that they will probably become the most popular vehicle for investing trust in the state's assets, at least for smaller trust in the states, uh, because they readily allow a way in which a trustee can diversify uh, and achieve broad diversification in an economic way. There will be a greater focus, I believe, on equities as well, and the decline of the fixed income approach, which has seemed to be quite traditional in terms of how trustees invest trust property. And in fact, trustees really can simply no longer just invest in a narrow group of authorized investments and preserve capital. Particularly if a trust has a long-term horizon, trustees will likely have to become more equity-oriented and growth-oriented in order to act as a prudent investor would in order to achieve appropriate investment returns. There's also greater accountability required of trustees, along with a higher standard of care, the requirement for diversification, and these new investment, mandatory investment criteria, there is now an increased level of accountability required by trustees to beneficiaries. So we anticipate that there may be a growth of perhaps more litigation in the area uh, involving trustee investment. Beneficiaries will be in a position to expect more, uh, to scrutinize and assess comparative investment performance, to, to challenge trustees where a trust or a state has clearly inferior investment performance, which has continued over a period of time and no action has been taken to correct it. Trustees will need to establish clear written investment guidelines for a trust or a state which reflect all of these considerations and they'll have to demonstrate that they have taken into account the mandatory criteria and they'll also have to more closely monitor the investment portfolios for which they are responsible to ensure that they always keep up to scratch uh, in terms of investment return and the considerations I've highlighted. As uh, professional advisors in this area, one, one issue I think that we should all take cognizance of is uh, the need to advise our trustee clients of the need to review their existing portfolios uh, to ensure that they meet the standards required by the new legislation. Uh, and individual trustees should be seeking proper legal and investment advice in this regard. There is obviously a much greater role now for professional investment management and the new legislation really gives statutory blessing for trustees to seek professional investment advice. So I think if I've done my six minutes, that's up and I just refer you to my paper if you'd like a more extended analysis. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Margaret. And uh, so now we go uh, to uh, Gaylan Phelan, uh, who will be talking about will clauses for mediation and arbitration of disputes. Gaylan. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> I'm doing a bit of a tag team thing here with Mary, so um, I hope to pick up where she left off. Uh, as Mary said, since September of 1999, 
all court proceedings involving an estate matter must go through mandatory mediation. But before mandatory mediation applies, a legal proceeding must have been commenced and the basic pleadings exchanged. The very commencement of litigation, however, may be perceived within the family as a declaration of war, and the pleadings may contain allegations which only fan the flames of family disharmony. Also, between the time of the testator's death and the time the legal proceedings are actually commenced, there may have been a fair delay, and not much has been accomplished, but frustrations have been allowed to build. Where the situation lends itself to it, I suggest that we discuss with our clients at the time the will is prepared, whether it would be advisable to build a dispute resolution mechanism into the will itself. This won't be appropriate for every situation, but it might be useful in some or all of these cases. One, where, there, where there's already perceived tension within the family. Uh, secondly, where the estate is of such a size that the administration by its very nature will likely be complicated. Or finally, where there are particular assets that may cause problems, especially where the testator has the attitude, well, let them worry about it, I'll be gone so it's their problem, not mine. I'm thinking here of the family business, the family cottage, the group of seven art collection, that kind of thing. Traditionally, it's been the executor's job to sort out disputes. Often the executor under a will was given the role of arbitrating disagreements in his or her absolute and uncontrolled discretion. But these, th uh, these words won't likely keep things out of court where the executor is also one of several beneficiaries. And even giving third party executors overriding decision making authority won't always prevent lawsuits against them where beneficiaries don't like a decision. I've included two sample clauses in my material which will give you something to discuss with your clients when taking will instructions in the appropriate situation. The first is a clause recommending that differences of opinion be referred to mediation. The clause says that any party may give written notice to the other parties of the need to appoint a mediator. If within, say, 10 days, a mediator has not been jointly agreed upon, then the will can name a mediation firm. The fact that Mary's and my firm, the Center for Estate Mediation, is named in the precedence is strictly coincidental. <laughs> Alternatively, a method for choosing the, the mediator can be established in the will. For example, a mediation firm practicing in such and such a geographical area is to be retained by the executors. The clause goes on to say that it is the testator's wish that any difference of opinion that may arise be resolved as early as possible and with a minimum of formality through the mediation process, and the testator has every confidence that this wish will be honored. The second precedent in the materials deals with mediation in much the same way, but then goes on to say that if mediation is not successful in resolving the party's differences within a fixed period of time, say 30 or 60 days from the, the date of the first mediation session, any outstanding issues should be resolved at the end of that time through binding arbitration. The parties are asked to settle the terms that would govern the arbitration process prior to the commencement of mediation. If the parties are unable to agree, the will makes a recommendation as to who the arbitrator should be. The clause goes on to say that it is the testator's wish that any decision made by the arbitrator be treated as final and binding on all parties interested in the estate and not be subject to further review. It also states that the testator has every confidence that all parties will agree to settle in advance on the process of mediation arbitration and the related procedures so that any differences of opinion can be resolved as early as possible and with a minimum of formality. Please note that the process of mediation and or mediation arbitration does not exclude lawyers. It's absolutely essential that each party obtain his or own professional advice before going into the process and preferably have his or her lawyer present throughout the entire process. Nothing would be more frustrating to everyone involved than to finally arrive at a settlement after many hours of mediation, only to have the deal fall apart when the parties take it to their lawyers to paper the agreement. In practice, the lawyers are almost always present at the mediation, and the agreement, or at least a memorandum of understanding, is drafted by the lawyers at the end of the session, and the handwritten agreement is signed then and there. 
The sample clauses that I've included don't address the question of costs. This is a matter for discussion with the testator. On the one hand, we don't want to encourage beneficiaries to take flyers at the expense of the estate. On the other hand, if there's going to be friction, and it can be resolved through three hours of mediation, it may be appropriate that the mediation costs, or some of them, be payable from the estate. In cases of arbitration, costs could be in the discretion of the arbitrator. It's an interesting question as to whether the will can actually direct the use of alternative dispute resolution rather than just recommend it. I spent much time pondering this very challenging issue and didn't really come up with a, a conclusion. However, with the introduction of mandatory mediation into the court system, the question may have become somewhat academic. In my humble opinion, and I disclaim any conflict of interest in making this remark, alternative dispute resolution is tailor-made for estate administration problems. I suggest that we encourage our clients to address it in their wills to cover the unfortunate event of a family disagreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail Ann. Uh, and uh, next, we have uh, Mary Louise Dixon on my right, uh, who is going to be speaking about drafting powers of, atten uh, powers of attorney. Sorry, Mary Louise. Thank you. Um, I have a paper in your material that sets out uh, some of what I'm going to talk about and includes in Appendix 1 some draft uh, clauses which are not magic, they are um, something I have put together. Now, powers of attorney were you originally a creation of common law, and there was no uh, form for them. The legal uh, stationers developed forms for uh, powers of attorney pre the substitution uh, decisions act but there was no magic in it and there's still no magic the substitute decisions act created a beast called a continuing power of attorney for property and this is a term of art that means that it will continue if the a person who gave it, the donor of the power, becomes in, incompetent. And the rules for continuing powers of attorney for property are set out in the Substitute Decisions Act. And it's defined, a continuing power of attorney is defined as a power of attorney for property that states it's a continuing power of attorney or expresses the intention that the authority given to the attorney may be exercised during the grantor's uh, incapacity to manage property. So rule number one is that if the power of attorney is to continue beyond the donor losing capacity, uh, it has to state that uh, it continues The next uh, point is that if it doesn't state that it's to continue during the donor's incapacity to manage property, the attorney only has authority while the grantor has capacity to give instructions. And this harkens back to the position of powers of attorney uh, pre-1980. Before then, it was you could appoint an agent, in effect, an attorney to act for you, but that person only had power to act while they uh, had capacity to instruct. And if they lost capacity to instruct, the power of attorney had no effect. And some seniors groups and the Alzheimer's groups realized this wasn't a satisfactory situation, and they campaigned to have a document that extended beyond the period 
uh, when a person lost capacity because that's when it's needed most. And that movement gave rise to this legislation. That's a bit of an aside. Now, the Substitute Decisions Act provides that the continuing power of attorney may be in the prescribed form. But uh, unfortunately, no form has been prescribed. This is a bit of a surprise, I think, to some people, that there actually is no form. The public guardian and trustee developed a kit that contains a form, and I think most people just assume that basic form has legislative effect, but it doesn't. So you're left with having to do it yourself. Now, attorneys uh, can be appointed to perform any task, general ta tasks, or their authority can be limited. So they can be limited, for example, to uh, dealing with a real estate deal while you're out of the country, or they can be granted power to do on the grantor's behalf anything the grantor could have done if capable except make a will. So the legislation specifically provides that an attorney cannot make a will. And in my paper, I've discussed whether uh, an attorney can redesignate RRSP and life insurance uh, beneficiaries. That is um, not entirely clear Probably they can because they're not excluded, but it's in a way uh, it's it's changing um, the recipients of property every bit as much as a will would. So when you meet with clients, you may want to address that. You can put pa uh, conditions and restrictions in the power, and if the power is to be limited the limitations should be set out. Now there's two recent cases that address some of the issues in this area. An Ontario case, Banton versus Banton, uh, dealt with whether attorneys could create a trust and put uh, the incompetent person's assets in a trust and de in effect change beneficiaries. And the Ontario Court of Justice, Mr. Justice Cullity, seems to have held that the words, the authorizing attorneys to do on my behalf, anything I can do by an attorney, was broad enough to authorize the creation of a trust but he set aside the trust in that case because the attorneys were beneficiaries. So they diverted assets uh, that would have gone somewhere else in effect to themselves and their heirs. And it was struck down. Another case is a BC case. And in that case, the Court of Appeal of British Columbia upheld the right of attorneys to do an estate freeze. But in that case, uh, the assets in effect were not irrevocably diverted from the donor. The donor had the right to income during lifetime. And if the donor recovered, uh, he had the right to recall the assets. So it wasn't a complete diversion. And based on these cases, it appears that um, these issues should be addressed with clients. If there's any chance that um, the attorneys may want to do estate planning uh, arrangements, estate freezes, set up trusts and so on. And uh, the document should address the extent to which the attorneys have power to divert assets from the 
donor's exclusive possession. Now the act also deals with um, where there's more than one attorney, they act jointly. And if you want uh, to arrange for substitutes, that the document should address that. It should also address what happens on the death of a joint attorney uh, if, if substitutes are to be um, named. Another tricky area is, is uh, to what extent the attorneys can make expenditures and make gifts for, that will benefit persons other than the donor. This all assumes the donor's not competent because, of course, if they're competent, they call the shots. And uh, again, it's, the document should address these issues because the uh, Act gives a fairly narrow power to make payments to dependents for their support and to make... Um, gifts and loans to friends and relatives and charities, but it's fairly narrow. I've included this section in Appendix 2. Another issue is the date the power of attorney is to become effective. Some people want it to be effective only when they become incompetent. This is tricky because you have if the document specifies that it's not effective immediately, but only when the person becomes incompetent, the third party bank or financial institution dealing with attorneys have to be satisfied the event has occurred before the attorney has any authority to act. I usually, um, make them effective immediately and tell the people not to give it to their attorneys if they don't want them to use it till a later point in time. And if they go bonkers and it has to be found, it'll be found. I think it's also a good idea to deal with uh, investment powers. Maybe you don't have to but it does clarify issues if, you, if the document sets out exactly what powers the attorney has to invest. And if the um, donor wants to make more than one power, the documents have to provide that he's making multiple powers of attorney. And um, this is a, another trick. Uh, question that should be brought up. Some people make, you know, a general power, but then they want to make a bank power. So your general power should provide that he's going to make or may make multiple ones. Then he can do his bank one. And that's about it. I also sometimes include an indemnification clause that attorneys are indemnified if they act in good faith. And I've given you some clauses. As I say, there's no magic. I, uh, there's some I drafted. If you have comments, I'd appreciate uh, receiving them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Louise. Um, what I think we'll do now is we'll have a, a changeover. So the, uh, the, the three remaining people um, will, will leave the stage. And perhaps the easiest thing would be if the next three uh, come up, which would be Terry Carter, Malcolm Archibald, and Janet Sim. And then we'll have uh, another changeover uh, after those three. Um, you will see that we have a rather short question period uh, scheduled for 3 o'clock. Uh, I hope the, uh, the speakers who will have spoken by then will remain behind and be available uh, for any questions at that time. And uh, somehow or other, we'll, we'll do that, whether they're sitting up here or, or in the, uh, the auditorium. So um, I'll just um, relax here while... Uh, you can speak from there, sir.
just, um, I'm not sure whether everybody was here when I um, began at the beginning, uh, but I'm not uh, reading out or even summarizing the, the bios of each individual speaker. Uh, they're in the materials, and just so that we can move along snappily, I'm just going to refer to them by name and try to remember to thank them, and uh, that's it. So uh, if Terry is uh, ready, um, the, the next speaker is uh, Terence Carter. Uh, who is going to be uh, speaking on advising charities in light of the Court of Appeal decision in the Christian Brothers case. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, it's nice to be here with you this afternoon. I was over at a section meeting of the charities. We had uh, Arthur Drache uh, speaking, and uh, uh, I had to run over here to make it, uh, make it in time. I wanted to speak with you today about uh, the impact of the Court of Appeal decision uh, involving the Christian Brothers, and some of you may already be aware of it. It's on the internet in the paper. I've given you the location where you can find it. A uh, decision was released on April the 10th. Justice Feldman of the Ontario Court of Appeal wrote the decision, and it reverses a lower court decision by uh, Blair Jay of the Ontario Court General Division back in February of 1998. In a nutshell, the decision is important because it means that special purpose charitable trusts are now expo exposed to claims by tort victims on a winding up of a charity. This is clearly going to have serious impact upon the ability of charities to raise monies, particularly endowment funds. The special purpose charitable trusts are, are part of what I refer to as donor-restricted charitable gifts. And if you want some more materials to refer to, uh, there's a couple of articles that are referred to in the paper that you can find at our website, and you're free to uh, to refer to it and download it if that would be of assistance to you. Special purpose charitable trusts can include uh, testamentary or inter vivos gifts of endowments, purpose restricted funds such as a building fund, or time restricted gifts such as 10 year gifts under the Income Tax Act. This has very serious implications to the practice of law involving charities. Leave to appeal has been uh, sought by a number of the parties, and uh, our section, the charity section, is studying seeking intervener status, possibly at the Supreme Court of Canada. In brief, the case involves the uh, Christian brothers who operated uh, the orphanage in Newfoundland, the now Cashel Orphanage. You recall from the press release uh, that there had been many, many claims resulting in $36, $36 million in judgments against the Christian brothers. They have assets of about $4 million. Uh, the Christian Brothers made application to wind up uh, their charity so that there would be as many assets available as possible. The Christian Brothers also own shares in two private schools in British Columbia who have combined assets in the amount of $38 million. So if you put the math together, you can see why there's an issue before the courts. There's not sufficient assets with $4 million, but if the schools in British Columbia are included, there's sufficient assets to satisfy the claims. So the issue before the court is, can there be um, a claim uh, made against the uh, schools, the two schools in British Columbia? The factual determination of the scope and the nature of the trust of the schools in BC were referred to the BC courts. The schools take the position that the shares of the school are not owned beneficially by the Christian brothers, but rather are held in trust for a specific purpose charitable trust. So the issue that was before the Ontario court was really a conceptual one, assuming that the schools were held as special purpose charitable trusts, were they extrajudicable by tort creditors? At the lower court, Blair Jay uh, dealt with the issue by distinguishing between general corporate property of a charity and a special purpose charitable trust, such as an endowment. And he said that uh, a general corporate property was subject to claims by uh, uh, creditors, uh, tort creditors, but in relation to special purpose charitable trust, that was not necessarily the case. It depended upon whether or not the trust assets were used in relation to uh, the commission of, the, uh, of the, um, the matter which gave rise to the claim. So there were some situations in which a special purpose charitable trust could be seized, but not as a general rule. The lower court set up very high criteria for what constitutes a special purpose charitable trust. It has to, in essence, use the words in trust. It has to have the three certainties of trust. That by itself has created some difficulty for lawyers dealing with charities. 
In the event that the BC schools were found to be special purpose charitable trusts, then uh, in accordance with the lower court decision, the schools would not be seized by creditors. On appeal, Justice Feldman agreed that, uh, that there was no doctrine, general doctrine of charitable immunity, but uh, she disagreed that a special purpose charitable trust could be dealt with differently in some situations. Instead, the Court of Appeal held that it was redundant for the lower court uh, to investigate the separate matter of a special purpose charitable trust. Once there was a rejection of a doctrine of charitable immunity, the Court of Appeal said uh, that was all that had to be determined. And as a result, whether assets held by a charity are its general charitable uh, property or whether it's held as a special purpose charitable trust like an endowment fund, doesn't make any difference. All of those assets are available to be seized by tort creditors in a winding up. Now, a couple of comments about the, the decision. Uh, even though the court um, has held that uh, there is exigibility of special purpose trust funds, they went to great lengths to recognize the validity of a special purpose trust and that there are trust obligations that flow from it. There can be breach of trust for noncompliance. There's a requirement of seeking a CPRE or a CIPRE a court order if the purposes become impossible or, or impracticable. The difficulty is and the inconsistency is that if the uh, Court of Appeal recognizes a special purpose charitable trust as a true trust, uh, then it follows that the other, uh, the characteristics of a trust should apply, and that is that the assets held by a trustee should not be subject to claims made against the trustee if those assets are not involved in the wrongdoing. Second comment is that um, it seems to me that there, because the reference to the Supreme Court of Canada decision and Beasley and Curry, that there's a policy a decision by the Court of Appeal that tort victims um, should have recovery against assets whether or not the logic necessarily follows traditional trust law. And then finally, the decision ignores, I believe, the inherent jurisdiction and obligation of the court to apply charitable trust property um, for another purpose in the event that it becomes impossible or impractical. The court said, if the charity ceases to operate, then the authority of the court to deal with it in a side prey is lost. Now, the impact of the decision of the court went to some length to say was very limited, only to tort victims where there's insufficient assets, the charity no longer operates, and there's a winding up under the Winding Up and Restructuring Act. I think that that's cold comfort. I think it's an arbitrary distinction, and the concern that uh, lawyers dealing with charities have is that it may be the thin edge of the wedge. There may be other situations where assets, particularly special purpose trusts, may become subject to seizure by tort victims. The impact upon charities is very significant. First of all, tort victims will be encouraged to, to seek out what have been otherwise protected property. There will be further deep pockets to access. <clears throat> there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars in endowment funds alone, let alone other special purpose trusts that may now be accessed, at least in Ontario. Secondly, those charities that are dependent upon endowment funds are going to have uh, a, possibly a serious problem in continuing to operate if those funds are taken away from them in relation to, to claims. Third is that the intention of a donor to create an enforceable special purpose trust uh, has been thwarted in situations where there's claim by tort victims. Fourth, donors are going to be reluctant to give large gifts directly to charities, i.e. endowment funds. Fifth, lawyers may be negligent if they fail to advise clients, i.e. donors or charities, that a special purpose trust may not be protected from claims of tort creditors. In responding to it, what sort of strategy can be put in place? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that it's probably little that could be done to credit-proof uh, special purpose trust after the fact. So make sure... Yes. I, I, okay. Two minutes? One minute? Uh, I'm 40 over. seconds. Okay. <laughs> Three things in the paper that I suggest in dealing with uh, a strategy and response, and uh, that's a matter of using possibly a parallel foundation in relation to endowment funds, possibly conditional gifts, um, and also maybe using uh, a um, community foundation as a recipient of, uh, of a gift. The decision is going to be, uh, have long-term implications. You need to study it carefully and then look at it in relation to your own practice, particularly in relation to drafting wills where you're drafting endowment funds for charities. Okay, Tim. Thanks so much, Terry. <laughs> uh, 
thank you, Terry. And so we go next to Malcolm Archibald, who's going to uh, speak about changes to the estate rules and forms. Malcolm. I, I noticed that Terry was too far away for yeah. you to hook, but I'm certainly in your range. <laughs> Uh, effective last March, there were a number of changes in the rules and forms affecting estates. And in my paper starts with a list of the forms that were changed. So if you want to know whether a form you've got is out of date and can't be used, you will find a total list of the form changes at the beginning of my paper. I apologize if any of you got caught short on March the 1st because while the, uh, the Rules Committee approved these form and rule changes back in November, the Ministry wasn't able to get them through the Cabinet until mid-February, and then we were caught, unfortunately, with a very, very short time period, and I do, we do apologize for that. Before I talk about what's in my paper, I thought I might just mention to you a little bit about the Estate Subcommittee of the Rules Committee, which is a committee that I chair. The other members of the committee are Madam Justice Haley, uh, Jill Bell from the Ministry, uh, Barry Corbin, Anne Lalonde from the Children's Lawyer's Office, Lori Redden from the Public Guardian Trustee's Office, and Brian Schnur. And it is a very hard-working committee. And the reason for that committee is that estate matters do require special rules in many cases that the ordinary rules just don't cover. And uh, uh, an example of that is mediation. We, we were very concerned, and we think uh, has been said, that mediation is very desirable in the states, but we recognize that a state mediation required special rules apart from the general rule for uh, mandatory mediation. So that's something we worked very hard on. When we have a special matter like that, we seek input from the uh, Ontario section of the Wills and Trust section of the CBAO, and so we try to get a little even broader input from the profession than just in our own limited committee. If you have any suggestions or having any problems with the rules or forms and, and have ideas of how they might be improved, certainly I would be very pleased to hear from you. Now to begin with um, some of the rule changes, um, there, are, there are two rules that provide that uh, somebody who thinks they might have some concern about a will that's going to be probated. The first one is a, a rule that says you can uh, ask for no, uh, uh, notice of commencement. And in that case, and then if you're more serious and you want to use the old caveat, you uh, apply for a notice of objection. Now the rules for both those matters said that the person who wanted to do that had to have a financial interest. Now. A case recently unreported uh, said that was, it didn't have to be an actual financial interest. It was good enough if the person appeared to have a financial interest. So we changed the rules to say now in certain many places where it said has a financial interest to appears to have a financial interest. Now we work very hard trying to make, avoid mistakes when we changed the rules, but another example of where we, you, we slipped up was in, in the first form, we changed the rules, but we didn't change the wording in the form. So the form still says that the person who's seeking the um, notification has a financial interest. We didn't change that wording. I've talked to Joel Persaud in the uh, state's court office, and he says that they will accept either the new wording, which would be appears to have a financial interest, or the old wording has a financial interest. So you can go with that form until we get it fixed up either way that's appropriate to you. Uh, another <clears throat> change in the forms is at the request of the Public Guardian and Trustees Office, they didn't want to be served with notice to beneficiaries uh, prior, the notice to beneficiaries prior to the application for probate. And so the form of notice to beneficiaries has been amended to take that uh, in, because of that change. Another change in that particular form is that the children's lawyer's office was often not getting, despite the fact the rule required it, was not getting given, being given the value of the infant's interest. And so the form has been adjusted slightly to highlight in the form that the, the value of the infant's interest must be right in the form, or where you want privacy, it can be in an in a, a, a accompanying schedule. But 
it's to highlight that that must be done. Um, now, unfortunately, and this was no mistake of ours, uh, when the, that particular form was gazetted back in February, the ministry made a mistake and paragraph five of the form was put in wrong. And uh, hopefully now, it was corrected in, on the April 8th gazette, and hopefully your form supplier will have the corrected form. But when I spoke to my, our own form supplier, who had already told about the problem and said, have you done it? They hadn't done it yet. So you really do want to check if you're using that form to see if you've got the corrected form. Now, probably the most significant change that we made in all the forms was in various applications where you're putting the description of details about the deceased person. And we've modified that to make a much clearer break between surnames and prenames. And the point of it is the court office were having a great deal of difficulty sometimes knowing what was a surname and what was not. And the reason why it's important is that we want the computers to, to connect and match. So if you had filed a caveat or a notice of objection, you sh darn well want to be sure that when the application comes in that, that they catch your notice of objection and give you notice. And there certainly were instances where that wasn't happening. And so I, we are very hopeful that this corrected way of setting out the names will prevent those kind of problems happening. Um, rule 7413 has been amended to deal uh, with the change from probate fees to the fees provided for under the Estate Administration Tax Act. And then uh, there is a, an unreported case called Reed and Martin, and in that case it was held that if a spouse is named as an executor but has elected against the will, then the spouse cannot be given a grant of probate. And so we've now amended the form to highlight that both to you, to draw to your attention that if you've got that situation, you shouldn't let the spouse be applying, and also to highlight to the court that, that, that if the answer to that is the spouse has elected, then that was very polite. <laughs> that if the spouse has elected that the grant, the spouse will not be, get a grant. And now my last little point I wanted to mention, that because of M versus H, the question about deceased conjugal relationship in several of the forms has been amended. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thanks very much, Malcolm. And so we go next to Janet Sim on my right, dealing with tax rules on charitable gifts. I must begin by alerting you to several typos in my paper, which I apologize for. First of all, any references to section 118 bracket 1 in pages 2, 5, and footnote 5 of my paper should properly be referenced to section 118.1 bracket 1, which you would have picked up, I'm sure, when you read my paper. I'm being optimistic. The second change is that um, the reference to footnote 10 in footnote 15 should properly be to footnote 9. So, so those are the two changes. Since 1996, the federal government has been most encouraging of charitable giving in Canada. There have been a number of legislative changes that have encouraged charitable giving. First of all, as many of you will recall, prior to 1996, one was only able to credit charitable donations against 20% of income. After 1996 and the present day is that we may now cha credit charitable contributions against 75% of income, which is a significant increase. And that's 75% of income in, while you're alive and against 100% of income in the year of death. 
the rules of also encouraged an increase in the gifting of appreciated property since 1996 100% of taxable capital gains are credited on the donation of appreciated capital property are creditable against income with the result that for most of us it's a net tax savings rather than a tax cost, as was previously the case. There is special encouragement, again, as many of you will know, for specific gifts of listed bonds and securities that are made after 1997 but before 2002. The usual capital gains inclusion rate is reduced for those sorts of gifts from 75% to 37.5%. The 2000 budget, as you know, provides or a proposal whereby the capital gains inclusion will be reduced to two-thirds, and there has been a similar adjustment on the donation of listed securities so that the income inclusion for those would be one-third. So it continues to encourage those who would donate stock rather than the proceeds of stock uh, to do that. Today I want to cover in the minutes that remain the basic rules of charitable giving. Who can we give to? And how is the relief provided? As well as some of the special rules that relate to the gifting of immediate, or the immediate gift of property and the deferred gift of property. Essentially, the Tax Act develops the concept of a qualified donee. That is the entity to which we may provide a donation and get tax relief. Well, it doesn't just include the registered charities as we know them. If you look at Section 118.1, bracket 1 of the Act, there is a list of those entities to which we may donate and receive tax relief. I'll let you read them, but they include, among other, municipalities, gifts to the United Nation, gifts to foreign universities that are prescribed under the Income Tax Act, gift to Her Majesty and Right of Canada and gifts to the province, and gifts to amateur athletic associations. It's also interesting to note that for those who might live close to the U.S.-Canada border and commute for their employment to U the United States, that their contribution to a U.S. charity entitles them to treat that contribution as a contribution to a registered charity for Canadian income tax purposes. A second interesting point is that for a Canadian taxpayer who has U.S. source income, and has made a U.S. donation, or a donation to a U.S. registered charity, that contribution may be credited against the U.S. source income up to 75%. Well, how is the tax relief provided? As you may remember, or some of you will, prior to 1988, it was by way of deduction. Since that time, it's by way of a tax credit. As I indicated earlier, in a year, a contribution is creditable against up to 75% of one's net income. In addition, you are entitled to a credit of 25% of the taxable, taxable capital gain on any property that you've donated to a charity and 25% of any recapture of depreciation on the same sort of donation. You may carry that unused portion ahead five years. In the year of death, it's creditable against 100% of income, as I indicated, and may be carried back one year. And a gift that is made by will is considered to be a gift made in the year of death. The credit is actually calculated by a fairly compu complicated formula that's set out in section 118.1 bracket 3 of the Act. The tax savings or value of the credit to us for an Ontario resident 
is equal to 25% on the first $200 donated and 40 to 50% on any amounts over 500, or sorry, over $200. Corporations, unlike individuals, are still subject to the old scheme of deduct deducting their charitable con contributions from income and are subject to the same percentages, that is 75% of income and 25% of capital gain, and have the same list of qualified donees which apply to individuals. And that's set out at section 110.1, bracket one. I'm now going to talk briefly about immediate gifts, which are the most common sort of gifts that one makes. First of all, gifts in kind. They're usually capital, and they're often non-depreciable. To the extent that they are, they're deemed disposed of at fair market value, and the donor is entitled to both a tax credit and a receipt for the fair market value. You will recall that there have been numerous instances of litigation over the valuation issue. I'm going to allow you to read my paper about the various other sorts of immediate gifts that can be made and the preferential treatment that are made according to the type of gift. For example, the gifts of cultural property are a bit unique in that the um, capital gains rules don't apply and there is an increased contribution limit from 75% to 100% on cultural gifts. With respect to gifts of ecologically sensitive property, which is new since 1995, there is also a, with the 2000 budget, um, an enhanced or a, a more advantageous capital gains inclusion of one third. They are also 100% deductible against income. Finally, the deferred gifts. I've lifted, listed three sorts of deferred gifts in my paper, which I encourage you to look at, the most important of which is the insurance. And the 2000 budget, as many of you are aware, have dramatically changed the way in which we may donate insurance proceeds to charity. We may now specifically designate a charity as a beneficiary, receive a tax receipt in the insured's estate, which can be used in the terminal return. So rather than having to go through the um, rigmarole of designating the estate as beneficiary and then providing in the will that the benefit of that tax um, or the, sorry, that insu insurance policy should be donated to the charity, we have a more direct method of achieving the same result. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. And so if we could now um, have another change around and uh, Ian Hull, Wendy Templeton and Laurie Redden um, come up to the uh, whatever this is, the stage. <laughs> um, Ian is first, I think. So it, it, it's Ian Hull is at the podium, and uh, Ian is going to uh, speak on indemnities and releases for trustees, if he's uh, ready and uh, willing to go. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. All right, well, before we start, I know I only have six minutes, but I've got to shake the crowd up a little bit here. Uh, I'm uh, surrounded by three young kids and tormented daily by them, and uh, my friend just recently emailed me a couple of good stories of one-liners offered by children. A couple of them just quickly. One of them was... Uh, when is it okay to kiss someone? And Pam, age seven, said, when they're rich. <laughs> Seemed like a good rule to me. What the next one is, uh, and I, I uh, often get asked by my oldest son why I keep reading this last page or, or a certain page in the Global Mail uh, called the death notices, and I would never admit to him that I'm always looking for new business, but I, uh, the one here that I thought was an interesting way to look at these uh, death notices when uh, Craig, age nine, is asked, what would you do on the first date that was turning sour? Craig said, uh, I'd run home and play dead. The next day I would call the newspapers and make sure that they wrote about me in all the death columns. 
So it seemed like good advice. So let me turn it out of the focus of here, limiting liability for trustees in a matter of minutes. Well, as we all know, the liability is personal. So we take that as our first step. So from my perspective, and I'm looking just from the trustee's perspective, what and when are you entitled to? And in order to determine, to determine what a trustee should receive in the form of release, acknowledgement, or indemnity, I, I tend to look at back of the document and look at the nature and extent of the obligations of the trustee. It's most often useful enough just to go to the good texts, Lindsay's book and Anne, uh, Mary McGregor's uh, references and so forth, get a good precedent and, and run with it. But sometimes that's simply not enough in terms of looking for an appropriate release uh, from your, in the context. And why it's not enough is uh, highlighted by this problem that your liability as a trustee is broad and it's personal. So I want to look at what the exposure is and how to limit such exposure. And my guidepost in terms of the exposure, of course, comes from two areas. The first is the trust document, the will itself. Look at that carefully. A lot of information can come from it itself in terms of the kind of parameters you're looking for in terms of the release you want to craft. The second is, of course, I have to adhere to the basic fiduciary duties uh, that are expected of a trustee. That uh, goes without saying. But when you look at the trust document dealing with number one, uh, for example, an interesting uh, 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 review is, if, look at the exculpatory clauses that are contained in it. And you can look at David Steele's great article in the Estates and Trusts uh, Journal on uh, some of the details of whether they're valid, whether or not they're enforceable, and so forth. But look at them and see where uh, you can give yourself some protection from that document in and of itself without the release even having been uh, signed. Looking at the fiduciary duties, of course, not exhaustive, but consider, of course, your duty to account, your duty to loyalty, your duty to not to delegate, your duty not to benefit from the trust, the basic fundamental fiduciary duties. We're protected, of course, by, the, by LPIC um, if we're acting as a trustee and a solicitor. In short, uh, you're generally covered um, when you're wearing those two hats, so that's a nice fallback position. Not that we ever have to use it, but it's nice to have it. The, th the third area, of course, to consider is liability to third parties. And that's something that sometimes gets overlooked by the trustee and may have to be crafted in, the, in, a, in a release that's uh, necessary. Because remember, a trustee is a principal of the beneficiary and not an agent of the beneficiary. And so, therefore, you can, as a trustee, incur personal liability in tort. For example, look to the Environmental Protection Act. Considerations there, of course, are paramount in the context of a trustee administering assets of an estate. Turning now to the concept of rights of indemnification. Well, again, I'm looking for a further limit on me as a trustee in limiting my liability. Well, indemnification, it's a concept we maybe heard a little bit about in law school. I always like to go back and look at the foundations. I look at Black's and I see what Black's Law Dictionary means and says and what it helps me. And it says, it talks about indemnification and the concept saying one person engages to secure another against an anticipated loss. So let's craft our release to facilitate that core responsibility, that shift from the trustee over to the beneficiary, and make sure it's clear from the standpoint of the beneficiary so that it's enforceable. Um, when does a trustee have personal, personal uh, rights against a beneficiary? Well, that's an important question to consider. I put in my paper, I refer to an Australian case, but highlighting some of the, uh, the parameters that you want to look to. But I look at it basically as two concepts. When I can go look to a beneficiary as a trustee, the, 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 the nice thing is the courts look at the principle that you live by the sword, you die by the sword. If you've got a benefit as a beneficiary, you have to take the good with the bad. You bear the burdens as well as the benefit. The second concept that the courts look to is that a beneficiary shares the liability in proportion to their respective beneficial interests. So in summary, I think I, got, I look to this protecting the trustee on a food chain basis. And I've got right from the top, I want to get my clearance certificate, obviously, and I want to get, if need, need be, I get a court audit of the accounts, and that locks me up pretty strongly. The next level down is get a comprehensive release that's drafted well and effectively. Ideally, get ILA from for the ILA, ILA for all of the beneficiaries. It, moving down the food chain, if all I can get is a release, I'll take a release. And then lastly, at the appropriate time on an interim basis and so forth, it may be necessary only just to get a receipt. Finally, my last comments are in terms of the form of the release itself. Again, I, I refer you to the texts. They all have excellent uh, uh, sources for that. But th it really depends on the nature of the gift. And look at the nature of the gift. Look at the will. 
And uh, sometimes it's helpful, I find, to give them formal accounts, circulate them as well at the same time. So I made it on my stopwatch with two seconds to go. Thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ian. And so next is Wendy Templeton dealing with deemed income. She's also escaping my reach. Uh, when, I, when I agreed to uh, address this topic, um, I did so a little bit reluctantly because uh, dealing with deemed income wasn't something that I had really uh, dealt with in... Uh, in my practice or in my, in, my, uh, in my work in estate planning up until this point in time. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to, to look at it. Um, but, you know, now that I have looked at it, I'm kind of reminded of the uh, experience I had when in, in law school when I had the uh, happy hour uh, term exam in the under the Mechanics Lean Act in a real property class. And, I remember there was something like four pages of lengthy facts, and one after the other, this, there were three schemes of Mechanics Lien Act, as I recall, which uh, attempted to uh, enforce uh, payment by the by the owner and, and protect those funds for for the the, uh, the construction industry. And as I went through each scheme, it appeared that none of them worked. And uh, just as the uh, invigilator said, "Time's up," I said, "This uh, set of facts." Uh, is designed uh, cleverly to avoid the Mechanics Lien Act. And I kind of feel that way about deemed income because I don't have an answer to the problem which, uh, which really was presented to me by Tim. So uh, with that introduction, I'd just like to go through what the sources of deemed income are, first of all. Um, in particular, uh, deemed income may arise on the disposition of property by a trust uh, when it's subject to the 21-year rule. And also, uh, say, where there are accruals of interest, uh, say, on an, a compounding um, interest-bearing uh, security. And also, uh, under Section 48.1, uh, there is an availability to make an election when a corporation turns public. And this election permits uh, a, a deemed disposition of shares of a qualifying a small business corporation so that capital gains exemption can be utilized. So the challenge is how do we uh, make deemed income payable uh, to a beneficiary so that can be taxed in the beneficiary's hands? And the way that we want to do that is uh, essentially we look at the provisions of the Income Tax Act, uh, Section uh, 106. Uh, Six provides for a deduction, and sub-13 provides for an inclusion. Um, the details are in, uh, are in the paper, but essentially, uh, in order for that to happen, the amount has to be either paid in the year or uh, payable in the year, and, and basically that means that the beneficiary has to be entitled to enforce payment in the year. So you have two problems. Does the terms, uh, do the terms of the trust permit that payment or making that payable. Uh, and remember that trust income is not necessarily income uh, for tax purposes. Uh, first of all, uh, under trust law, we're looking at the common law definition of income, not what's d defined in the Income Tax Act. Capital receipts, for example, would not even be considered income. So first thing you want to do is if, if we have a deemed disposition which, say, creates a capital gain, um, we want to make sure that there's a power to encroach on capital or that somehow or other there's the ability of the trustee to allocate that as income. And you will sometimes see a, a clause in, a, in, in a, a will or in a trust document that permits the trustees to make that allocation. Even that, though, probably isn't, probably isn't enough uh, because there are many types of uh, deemed income which, I mean, they may not even be capital receipts because there really is nothing that's been received. So I think the first thing is you, you need a, some pretty broad powers in your trust agreement when you're dealing with uh, deemed income, sometimes called phantom income. And I'd really encourage uh, Mary and, and, and Lindsay uh, you know, in, in, to look at this paper and, and think about some of the broader uh, clauses we might need in order to deal with deemed income. Certainly, I think you want a power in the will uh, to encroach on capital, to make payments of deemed income, 
and uh, to, to make, maybe make payments in, in lieu of actually distributing uh, property uh, under deemed income. Now, th the situation in which this becomes most important, I think, is where you're trying to utilize the capital gains exemption. And, th and in that case, the only way the capitalizing capital gains exemption can be utilized is by having it in the uh, beneficiary's hands. And uh, this really is a, a significant uh, uh, matter. And w at the conclusion of the paper, uh, I suggest that you know perhaps there is a, a legislative remedy here to either maybe reintroduce the preferred ben beneficiary election uh, to, to permit this, or to maybe make parallel rules with respect to what n now is in existence for a spousal trust. Because a spousal trust on the death of the uh, trust, or pardon me, on the death of the spouse, can actually utilize the capital gains exemption uh, of the deceased spouse. And so it's not necessary in that case uh, to be concerned about the deemed disposition of property qualifying for the capital gains exemption. I'm okay? Well, no, I can go on. <laughs> okay. Um, I also talked a little bit about um, maybe some, some ways in which uh, uh, amounts can be made payable without actually distributing property. And there's two interpretations by Revenue Canada that I've referred to, and I realize it's not Revenue Canada anymore, but I'm still stuck on that, um, in the paper, which indicate that perhaps it's not necessary to actually distribute capital property in order to allocate a capital gain in respect of that property uh, to the beneficiary. And I have to kind of read between the lines in some of these interpretations, but I think that that might be so. And for example, where uh, you have a deemed disposition or you want to make the election under 48.1 to utilize the capital gains exemption, uh, it might be possible to actually make uh, a payment other than in, in, in kind of the, of the capital property in order to uh, allocate this gain to the beneficiary. Um, I've, I've made some suggestions as to how that might happen, and certainly you would want the trust provisions to be broad enough uh, to permit that. And I think you've got some, tr some trust questions too, where, for example, you know, there's more than one beneficiary and you have competing interests, you might be uh, mixing up your income and capital beneficiaries and income and capital receipts somewhat. Um, and that would also, uh, th that problem can also arise where, for example, you're trying to make payments in, in lieu of um, uh, res income, which is uh, in, uh, interest accrual. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wendy. And uh, the, the last speaker in this uh, section of the, uh, of the afternoon, Laurie Redden, on recent developments in the public guardian and trustee. I think it means in the office of the, of the public guardian and trustee. <laughs> Who knows? But it could take me six minutes to explain that, so I'm not going to. Um, first of all, I want to thank Tim for the invitation to speak to you today. And in um, particular, thank him for not asking me to talk about the Substitute Decisions Act or tax, because I'm a tax idiot. Um, secondly, um, in terms of recent developments, you'll find that I, I prepared a sort of six-minute version paper. And um, I included in there sort of a potpourri of things that have been going on in our office over the last couple of years. Um, I am the, even though this is the new six-minute estates lawyer, I'm the same old six-minute estates lawyer who spoke at the last one of these. And I am committed today to not having Tim tell me that my time is up. So I'm not going through anything in, in the paper. And I wanted to tell you, well, because you can read that, I wanted to tell you about um, the latest little initiative going on at our office that I thought you actually might be interested in as practicing lawyers. Um, our office is uh, engaging in a project to formalize and expand um, our retention of private counsel on behalf of our clients. Doesn't this strike at the heart of most of you, right? So, um, what, you know, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to work with our clients, um, what do we do? Well, the thing that we retain outside counsel for the most part is for varying types of civil litigation. 
Um, that includes trust and estate work, um, insurance law, other kinds of torts, uh, real estate litigation, and a large component of a wide variety of family law, uh, divorce act, family law act, um, property division, uh, support both spousal and child, child welfare matters, custody access disputes, pretty well the whole gambit. Um, in, outside of, also including in, in that list, litigious as well as just uh, general work is in the area of corporate commercial law. This is something that we don't practice in-house at the public guardian and trustee's office except for, you know, companies who are dissolved and their assets are forfeit to the Crown, right? That's not your usual corporate commercial law. Um, so, uh, you don't have to take my word for this. You will see an ad in the Ontario Reports, hopefully on June 23rd, and also on July 7th, um, that sort of outlines these areas and looking for people interested to do our work. And um, we're, we have a deadline for applications of July 21st, there will be, of course, a form to complete. And um, the form's gonna be on our website, and I could give it to you, but the address will be in the ad. So, um, I hope any of you who are interested in representing our clients, who are all worthy of legal representation, as you know, including the client I represent, um, I hope you'll consider um, applying. If you have any questions, um, you could call us, but there isn't a phone number in the ad, so you can call me. And um, thanks a lot for listening. Well, thank you very much, Laurie, and, and you've, uh, you're amazing because we were behind time, but you've caused us to end up about 30 seconds before three o'clock. Now, the, the program does say question period, and it sets aside 10 minutes. Um, what I would just suggest, uh, if anybody does have any questions, we'll use this time, and uh, obviously not just for the ones who happen to be left here, but also the other people who are, I think, except for uh, Margaret O'Sullivan, are all still here as well, and they either can dive up here and get in front of a microphone, or if they've got big voices, can just speak from where they are. Right, yes. Okay, uh, good question. <laughs> Why would you ever sign a release? I, that certainly crosses my mind from time to time. I think there's a couple of times. I, one thing I did note in my paper was there's a couple, there are some authorities that says that if you put that provision in the will, it must be signed and that the gift will not pass until it's signed. That's an interesting little clause you can throw in your drafting uh, to force the beneficiary to sign. But in the normal course, that kind of provision is not in the, uh, the will. Why would you get them to sign is, uh, I, I don't think you're going to go as far as the finding of negligence for having told someone to sign it, but it seems to me that there's two issues. One is it's the practice and it's a it's a maybe it's a silly practice but it's a practice that I see from time to time al almost daily you see someone who, who is administering a state and they send a, even interim uh, payments and they say sign the release and the release is broad and it covers off everything um, and I think people sign it blindly and I think the enforceability of those releases is very suspect uh, in, in a lot of situations um, but generally speaking, I think once the assets have been distributed and administered properly, I think his trustee is entitled to a release. And I think, uh, I mean, I haven't uh, had to go to war on the thing, but I would think that I've got a shot at enforcing that. But How would you know they were administered properly? Well, once you get disclosure. You get, find out if you've got the clearance certificate, find out, give, I often will tell my clients with the materials, send out an informal set of accounts. But it isn't, but sure, the alternative will be that uh, the, the trustee will say, well, I've got to pass my accounts. Yeah. If the residuary beneficiaries won't agree to release, yes. I'll pass my accounts. Do you want the cost of that to come out of your residuary share? That's, that's exactly it. You just say, okay, fine, we'll get an audit. I need a release in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a court audit or it's, it's in the form. And if everyone's sui juris, it should be signed without any fuss. Okay, any, uh, yep.
Uh, was that a question? Or <laughs> it, I'm not sure who that's addressed to of the people who've spoken today. Yeah. It does sound like really Brian Schnur's question because it's essentially a compensation issue I think you're raising. But, but, but isn't the answer yes, it, to the extent that expert advice or assistance is needed, then to act properly you've got to obtain that if you don't have that expertise yourself. But at the same time, uh, if you're seeking to be compensated for what you do, if you're getting uh, somebody else to do something that otherwise would be within your function. But are you saying, and you keep the full compensation? Well, I, I, I don't know about that. It always seems to me odd that um, an exec if you ha have a trust company administer an estate and they in and do the investment themselves, they charge a certain uh, rate for doing that. If you have somebody else who then goes to investment council and assume that that's proper in the circumstances, it's odd to me they can charge the full rate that an executor would otherwise get, plus the beneficiaries, if in effect, have to pay for the investment council's fees as well. But anyway, that's I think, really, is Brian's uh, topic. Um, whoa, uh, let's just see how we're doing. Uh, yeah, um, oh, sorry, we'll go here. I think we'll have a bit of gender equality here. I think that's Mary Louise, but I'd say, first of all, that there should be a disclaimer of the sort that Revenue Canada has on one of their interpretation bulletins. This sounds like the facts of an individual case, and we, do, we don't give individual advice. But um, Mary Louise, can you <coughs> speak to that? Yeah, and, and of course, you never know for sure that what you think to be the will is, in fact, the last valid will. So you never know for sure who might be claiming uh, through the estate. Uh, I would have thought the safe thing is if, if something is something that sensibly ought to be done, but it's of an estate planning kind, uh, and, it, and there's sufficient money to justify it, you should get the directions of the court. And under the SDA, there is a specific provision uh, providing for um, attorneys and guardians to, to get the court's direction. That will then protect the the attorneys, uh, um, uh, assuming they get the court's authority to do it. Um, and I think that's the only cautious thing to do. Um, yeah. So you're saying an affidavit is is being purportedly sworn by the donor of the power of attorney, but is is. But but to do what? What is it saying? No, oh, in the name of the attorney. But what's the affidavit relate to? Uh. 
I, I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer. I mean, I, I think on, an attorney can only swear the attorney's own affidavit. You can't swear an affidavit on behalf of somebody else. That, that's clear to me. But I'm not sure whether that answers your question. I think you definitely can't. I mean, you can't yeah, swear. Can't you set up the fact that they know? Yeah, just a comment because a lot of times you'll see uh, by John Smith, who is not a non resident of Canada, and then you'll see John Smith's name underneath as a signature and by his. No, I don't think that's not possible. <laughs> no. No, okay, but I, I just don't think that's, that's proper. One more question, then we'll have our break. Yeah. I think a lot depends on the disclosure that's been given to the beneficiaries and the strength of the releases that you have. Uh, if it's been properly done, they've got ILA, they've been given formal accounts or informal accounts, they've been, you know, all the information has been given to them and they still sign the release, you've got it in hand and then they turn around and try to create some more litigation by imposing a, a, you, know, you to pass the accounts. I, I think you have a shot at it. I, my general impression is it's very difficult to get security for costs. It's changing, but there's a lot of old authority that make it difficult in the context of estates. But you've got a good shot at it, and it may as well uh, ruffle some feathers. Okay, if we could break now, and we'll uh, begin again at 325.